Welcome, everyone, to the MMA Happy Hour podcast. I am Kyle Anthony, your host. Where today we are talking UFC 307, a stacked card headlined by Alex Pereira and Khalil Roundtree. We're going to be breaking down four plays here on the show today. If you want to become a client, link down in the description. Listen, we have a 5% max. We are 11 and 0 on these plays in 2024. Absolutely dominating. Nearly 90 units in profit in MMA. 80% of UFC events we have cashed this year as well. Just out there doing God's work, dominating, feeling good, and um, got to keep it going here. Got to keep it going here. Locked in. So again, link down description. Take a look right now. Number one return on investment capper in the entire company of wager talk feeling great about it in all sports we're just doing mma over here but we're just cashing tickets so uh with that being said we are going to dive into the main event of the evening between alex Pereira and khalil roundtree now looking at this fight here we've got a big favorite minus 500 and listen for all the right reasons he is a killer he is a he's got the ability to put anybody's lights out who he's faced all of those things but when you look at khalil you know i think one of the biggest things here when you're looking at him is that he doesn't shoot for takedowns and i think if you're not doing that that's going to open up opportunities here for alex Pereira to get very comfortable on the feet be able to walk you down throw big shots and that's going to hurt khalil here out of his 14 ufc fights zero takedowns. so i don't expect him to be diving at legs at all also one of his big weapons is the leg kicks you know and that's another spot where I think that Alex Pereira is able to kind of really nullify where he's got great. He can check leg kicks very well and also fire off his own. I think it really spells a lot of problems here for Khalil, adding in the fact that Pereira also has a three-inch reach advantage, a three-inch height advantage. I think his counter-striking ability is going to be way better. His shot selection is way better. And even Khalil is a kind of guy who's going to move forward and throw. And that's a perfect situation here because Khalil is very hittable in the pocket. You know, he has a negative striking differential when you're looking at it. Um, he lands three and a half significant strikes per minute while absorbing over four. While on the other side, you've got Alex Brera who lands nearly five and a half significant strikes per minute, but absorbing only three and a half. And that to me really opens up opportunities here for Pereira to move forward, throw big shots and find that finish. Now, Khalil on the other side here, you know, I think it's probably one of the worst rises to a title shot. When you're kind of looking at it here, he was one in three, then one five straight. But if you look at the last four wins that he has had, they are not good at all. Um, he got Carl Roberson, who was o on an 0 and 4 run and now fighting at bare knuckle MMA. Uh, he uh, also beat Dustin Jacoby, who's on a one and four run in the UFC. And not only that, but Jacoby actually ended up outlanding Khalil 120 to 85. Yet Khalil still got the nod. That's a little bit of question mark there, but he got the victory. Uh, two fights ago, he beats uh, Chris Dawkins, Chris Dawkins on an 0-4 run and also not with the UFC anymore. And then most recently, he beat a UFC analyst in Anthony Smith, who's on a 2-3 and three run and really is just, you know, slow, washed. And even in that spot there, Khalil was very neck and neck with strikes landed before the knockout happened. Um, Khalil was outlanding him 53 to 47, not good. And when you're talking about you're about to face one of the best kickboxers on the planet, I think it spells a lot of bad things for Khalil. So I do like Alex Pereira here. I think he gets the absolute job done inside the first two rounds. You're getting off the minus 500 number here. A KO within the first two rounds is minus 110. I like that number. And I do believe Alex gets that knockout within the first two rounds. Now, next one here we're going to be talking about is going to be the other title fight. We've got Raquel Pennington versus... Um, Juliana Pena here, and this is going to be the opposite of really what's going to be happening in that main event. I think this is going to be a very slow-paced fight. Uh, it's more positional. They're both going to be kind of pushing each other up against the fence, working time, you know, you know, banking um, rounds, whether it's up against the fence or on the ground. And the other big thing here is that on the feet, I really favor Raquel Pennington. I mean, I don't like any of the striking that you're seeing from Juliana here, it's sloppy. She leaves her chin up, very lackluster striking defense, does not look good on the feet. And yes, she can do, you know, the same kinds of things that Raquel can looking to, you know, cage push and positionally win. But I do think that Raquel Pennington's 60% takedown defense rate should hold up here. I do think she can sprawl and brawl, land good shots, 
keep distance, keep at range, and then be all the way in when she needs to be to kind of cage push and dirty box. And I think that's going to work out well for her here. But the other part of it is there's a couple big red flags against uh, Julia Pena here. And I think the first one is, is that she hasn't fought in two years. You know, the last time she fought was back in July of 2022. And that was when um, Amanda Nunes went out there, was slapping her around for five rounds, dominated the fight, an easy win for her there. And not only that, it's been a two round, a two year layoff, but also the fact that she's 35 years old. So she's been on the shelf now, you know, kind of you know, leaving her prime and sitting on the sidelines here. She gets an opportunity because she kind of doesn't shut up, but she gets an opportunity here even after a loss. Um, and this is going to be a spot where you have that. And then also the fact that she has fought really nobody besides Amanda Nunes when you're looking at it. You know, uh, Pennington really has fought high level fighters, but some of these women that, you know, Pena has beat, uh, you know, a 41 year old Sarah McMahon, um, a four and three pro record for Nico Montoya, um, Jessica, I 15 and 11. I mean, these are some bottom feeders, but she was able to get the title opportunity here. I do think this is going to have, this is going to go the distance out of, uh, Raquel Pennington's 10 last 10 victories, nine of them. Went to the decision. I do think where that's where this one goes here. And you're getting off the minus 170 number. You're getting plus 110 on a very likely path for Pennington here. So I do like her to get the job done via points plus 110. And the next one here we're going to talk about is Ryan Span minus 275 versus Ovin St. Pru plus 220. Now, this is a spot here where you've got two big boys. Who are willing to exchange two light heavyweights who are finishers and yet extremely, extremely untrustworthy. And then you that just purely brings a lot of variance to this fight. And now you've got a guy that's nearly a minus three, uh, minus 300. So it does seem a little bit wide right out the gate, but you look at them, they're both finishers. Open thing, Pru, 27 wins, 20 by knockout. You've got Span, 21 victories. I'm not, not by not by finish, uh, 21 victories, 18 by finish as well. So these guys are able to go out there and throw. Now, Span is a guy that's a great hammer, a terrible nail. When he starts moving forward and he's feeling good, he can get takedowns, throwing big shots, winning positionally, doing all these great things. But if things are going his way, it really starts to fall off a cliff. I mean, he struggles with pressure, um, you know, when things are, uh, you know, when, when he starts to kind of feel that pressure, he makes a lot of mistakes. His fight IQ is very low. And there's even been spots where he has had, you know, the opportunity to really be in a dominant position and just made mistakes and allowed his opponent to either knock him out or, or, or reverse the position and find opportunities to win the round. I mean, it's just a lot of bad things that he does, but also the fact that he's a big front runner and he's not even the greatest front runner when you're looking at it. Uh, span 14 out of his 14 UFC fights, nine ended in the first round. He's five and four over that span. And he's on an 0-3 run and lost twice via finish. Now, when you look at it the other side here, you know, you've got Open St. Prue, who is coming off a career best performance against Kennedy as a chick woo, where he landed a hundred and forty-three significant strikes. I thought it was absolutely impressive. He was a big dog in that spot. And you know, listen, I don't know if he had his Wheaties uh sipping on secret juice, but this guy looked great for a guy who's in his 40s and and from the last few fights has looked really bad, unmotivated. Um, you know, he gets hit, he turns his back and he totally changed that up a little bit here and looked great. And now you're looking at a number of plus 220 next to him. That says a lot right there. And I think he can mix up, you know, with some speed, some power, push forward, throw big shots here. Um, and also, even if they're exchanging, I do think that Span's KO power is a little overstated because out of his 21 victories, six or by knockout. So he does need those submissions to find those victories here. So in this spot here, I'm taking the dog. I think it's worth a nice little sprinkle here. Open St. Pru plus 220. And the last one here we're going to be talking about is going to be Kayla Harrison. She's minus 1000 against Catlin Vieira, who's plus 650. Now, this is a spot here where you know, UFC was begging 
maybe not begging, but they really wanted Kayla to come over to the UFC. She's been a champion and, and beating up a bunch of bums over at the PFL. And she was able to come over here and get a good victory over Holly Holm. So credit to her beating a 42-year-old uh, Holly Holm, but she was able to go out there and find success. Now, Callan on the other side here, I think is getting very overlooked, um, especially at this number here. Callan's four and one out of her last five, you know, has looked good in certain spots. You know, yes, she's fought some aged out fighters as well, but she definitely has looked good she's well-rounded she's got a little bit of power she's got some ground game and the big advantage here for um kayla is going to be her strength and physicality she's going to look to push forward get those takedowns get those control time and bank the rounds utilize some of her judo utilize some of her wrestling and that can work for her but the other part is you know Kayla's a big girl too you know she's no slouch either i think that she can make it a little tough when they're striking, I think her striking is better than Kayla's. She's going to be a little bit tougher in the clinch, harder to get down. But I do think Kayla is able to get these takedowns and get control time. But I do think she's going to struggle to get this finish. I, I think she can bank the rounds, dominate. I think she should go 20, uh, 30, 27. I, I think there's a probability for that, too, that she can go out there and dominate. Um, but the people she's finishing are, are really not that good. I mean, no offense to Holly Holm. 42 years old, a perfect stylistic uh, matchup for her, really. Um, but the people she was beating and finishing in the PFL are some terrible fighters. You know, uh, you know, Bellator, PFL, these are some bad fighters um, or just very, very green fighters overall. And, you know, she goes out there and, and some of the people that she was beating, like in like the playoffs and the season for PFL, I mean, she beat a, a, she finished a six and five fighter. Uh, she finished a, a 12 and 13 fighter. It sounds like a lot of people are, are finishing her as well. Um, five and two, five and four. I mean, these, that's the level she's finishing. Cause I don't think that her submission game is as high, especially if you're about to face somebody like Catlin Vieira, who I think can defend on her back. I think that she can at least survive and get through some of these and make it difficult for Catlin, I'm sorry, for uh, Kayla to kind of cut distance and all those other things. So I do like Kayla here. I do think she gets a job done. I do think she's able to do that, but not able to get the finish. So getting off of the minus 1,000 number, I do like Kayla Harrison plus 110 to win via points. I think it's a great spot for her and a very likely path. So there you have it for UFC 307. If you want to become a client, link down in the description. Don't forget, we're 11 and 0 on 5% plays in 2024. Got one this Saturday night. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's cash.